All right, and our recording has started. If I can get that to go away. Okay, well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me for another one of the Siemens seminars. Today, we're going to have a chance to talk about memory, memory management within the Ceramic controls. Uh, we're going to kind of explore all things kind of around that topic. Let me introduce myself to those of you that uh, may not be familiar with me. My name is Chris Pollock. I'm the International Business Development Manager here at for Siemens MTS in the United States. Um, so I work with a lot of importers and machine tool builders that are building and selling products in the U.S. with the Cinemaric controls. I would say for my side, my expertise tends to be more from the operation and programming perspective, not necessarily the commissioning side. But with that being said, I can certainly be a resource for you guys um, to maybe get you to the right person, if I'm not them, um, or hopefully I can answer some questions for you too. So uh, my information's here. Don't hesitate to reach out. I would say easiest way to get me would be just to shoot me a quick email. Let me know how I can help and maybe I can facilitate that. Now, before we get right into the topic at hand, I do always like to, to take a few minutes here and kind of plug some of the resources that are available to you guys, um, specifically um, from the, uh, the website, uh, the web-based um, resources we have. So our core website is the CNC View website. You see the email address right at the top. Um, that is kind of you know the the primary landing page for all things cinemaric in the operation of programming realm uh, so i would say if you if you guys haven't been to the cncv website you want to navigate over there we have links to all of our past webinars there's all kinds of customer testimonials tips and tricks all sorts of videos additionally we do host a bunch of training classes. We do online and in-person training. So if you click on the training, you get to a tab and you can see certainly the online classes as we see here in front of us. Um, these classes are multi-day events where you would sign up for a specific topic or course. You're working directly with a trainer, so they are live trainings. Um, typically, they're about a you know three-hour lecture period where we're going to introduce you to a topic. Um, we actually give you homework assignments. You get to work on it, come back, tell us how you did, ask more questions, go through more topics. So it's a really great format. Um, we were starting to do some of the online before COVID, um, but certainly through COVID, it just uh, proved a great way to deliver material and content. So we're going to continue with that, especially for what I would consider more of our entry level topics. Now, when we get to more advanced topics um, there, I would say take a look at our in-person trainings. So we do host classes more for the advanced topics, uh, for argument's sake, like our five axis class or our dealer training class. Um, those would be held at our facility, our training facility in Elk Grove Village, Illinois. Um, so that is not too far from the O'Hare Airport. It's maybe a 10 minute ride. So it's pretty convenient to get in and out. Now, all of our classes we do, whether they be virtual or in person, it's all 100% complimentary. So we feel if you're taking the time to come in and work with us and learn our product, uh, we certainly want to be able to give back to you there. So there is no charge to attend those classes. Now, additionally, um, you may or may not be aware of our Mr. CNC YouTube channel. So certainly you'll find a lot of our stuff right there on the CNC for you channel. Um, but I would say keep, uh, keep an eye also on the Mr. CNC channel because on this one, there's additional information. Um, I do a YouTube live segment try to do it monthly doesn't always happen but there is a lot of youtube live segments where we're actually doing live cutting demonstrations right on a machine tool uh, we have a little a lot of little how-to videos and promotional videos i also link to a lot of our other colleagues content globally so if you haven't gone over to the channel by all means do so um, and certainly 
follow the channel if you can like the videos give us contents the contacts and and share those videos because this is certainly real important for us showing that uh, this is a venue that we want to keep uh, putting time and, and money into uh, so wherever you can we appreciate that and just to give you an idea um, you know this was one of the one of the previous YouTube lives we did um, I like to partner with technology partners whenever we can so in this case we use some OSG thread mills and we did some thread milling examples right on the machine so if you haven't been to Mr. CNC head on over there check it out and uh, if you get some ideas of content for us to do by all means email them to me um, another resource there that you guys may not be aware of is our virtual product expert program so this program allows you to basically schedule or block time with a product specialist and really dig into all things Cinemaric. Um, now from our team side would be specific to operation or programming uh, tasks, but even if it's more of a technical nature, maybe a little more commissioning based, reach out to us. We can always lean on one of our other colleagues. Um, my colleague Daniel Batulo manages this program. Um, simplest way to to book or schedule a VPE event, as we like to call them, is just go back to that CNC training tab found on the CNC for You website, like I showed you earlier. And what you want to do is instead of clicking training classes, click on the virtual product expert. That will give you a little little area where you type in what your interest level is, um, your contact information, and then Dan will reach back out to you, and then you guys can schedule up an event, and then he'll either run the event or he'll pull in um, somebody else to actually be the product specialist for the event. But by all means, um, please take advantage of the this service, and again, this, just like our other classes, is completely complimentary. Okay. So we got through the the initial fun stuff. Now we're going to kind of get into the meat. So a lot of times when I do these is different webinars, um, we tend to focus on one control platform over the other. Um, we also tend to look at technology. Um, in this case, although we're going to be focusing from a mill perspective, what we talk about it really would apply to any control platform. Um, and with that being said, Certain pieces of this are going to comply, apply to any of the controls within our portfolio. So where I can, I will try to point out what features or options will work on one system over the other. Um, but some piece of this webinar will apply to the 808 control, just like the 828, certainly our 840. And let us not forget our newest and greatest control, our Cinemark 1. So the Cinemark 1 is the latest release of the Cinemark family and it will be uh, replacing the 840 as our flagship product. Um, so certainly um, the functionality we're going to talk about would apply to any one of these four controls. Now not necessarily to all of them and I will caveat that as we go through. Okay so the, you know, when I started to put this material together I wanted to kind of talk about memory right because I think on the surface, everybody just has this kind of back end assumption of what memory is, but do we really ever kind of dig into it and dissect what's there in the system and what's available for us, depending on you know who we are and kind of what level we're engaging with the product? So initially, I think it warrants talking about what is part program memory versus system program memory. You would assume it's all one and the same. But in fact, it is not. We have memory allocations reserved specifically for users uh, for their part programs, and that would be fallen under the part program memory area. But we also have memory allocations for the actual control itself, and that's our system memory. Um, and that's going to be um, more of a topic for gentlemen that are doing commissioning on the system, right? They're, they're integrating custom screens, they're enabling different numbers of variables and offsets, all that kind of stuff uses up memory, but it doesn't necessarily use up your part program memory. So we always want to kind of differentiate that. I think years back, they were all pulling from the same common memory area. So an OEM, if he wasn't paying attention to how he set up the machine, could use up all of the end users part program memory. So we've tried to kind of differentiate that and split up the system. So there is memory in both areas and locations. 
Now, just like we have those two different memory areas, depending on the control system you have will depend on how much resources and power is there within the system. So we really have three primary variations of controls. We have the NCU, which you guys see on the left, that's our numerical control unit, and that is probably the most common platform when we look at Cinemaric 1 and 840 DSL units. They're running this NCU. It's typically panel mounted back in the electrical cabinet and that's really the brains. That's the computer for the CNC control. Now if we take a look at something like an 808 or an 828 and as well uh, a certain variant of our Cinemaric 1, we offer what we call the PPU, a panel processing unit. So the difference between an NCU and a PPU is really, it's pretty simple. We just took the guts of the NCU, but built it in behind the operator panel. So for us, it's a little more modular, right? So we have a tendency to sell these configurations more on your standard commodity type of machine tools. Uh, for us, it's a little bit more cost effective to manufacture um, by putting it all bundling all together, but from the OEM, there's less variations and less flexibility of what he can build with. So that's why you would have a PPU versus an NCU. Now, for the more elaborate systems, you can also have an industrial computer, which we call our industrial PC. Now, in this case, that industrial PC would still be talking to the NCU unit. So you'd actually have both. So the, the industrial PC is used in cases where an OEM needs to build a machine and they want a Windows front end. Traditionally, the PPUs and the NCUs is using a Linux operating system, where an IPC, industrial PC, has a Windows environment, but it's still talking to the NCU. So you actually have both pieces of hardware in there. Now I bring this up because there's a lot more storage potential on an IPC because of the hard drives and everything than there would be on the CF card, which is what we actually use to hold our software and hold our memory on an NCU or a PPU. So when we talk about these different memory allocations and what I can do, it can change a little bit based on your hardware. Okay, so if you want to start to dig in and get a good understanding of kind of what makes up your specific system, whether it be your 808, 828, or maybe your Cinemaric 1, a great resource for you guys would be to go to this Siemens.com forward slash Cinemaric website. Now the Cinemaric website, when you go here, you're going to see there's the CNC systems. And if you click on that little CNC systems button, it's going to drive you over where you can select which of the control variations that you want to find more information out. And there's a whole wealth of information that you can find um, on these websites. However, with that being said, if you scroll to the bottom, right when you get to like the Cinemark 1 landing page or the 840, you will see there'll be a downloads link and there's the functional overview link. By clicking that functional overview, what it does is it's going to allow you to download and open what we call our NC catalog. So the NC catalog, this is kind of like the base catalog for all things that specific control. So each of the systems is going to have a different numerical value in the NC catalog. NC63 happens to be a Cinemark 1, NC62 would be an 840, so on and so forth. But I point this out to kind of drive you there because this is a great spot not only to see the resources that what your system currently has, but you can also see the options that are available and the option codes and everything. So all of that can be found inside the NC catalog. So for argument's sake, if I wanted to know, you know, what is the maximum buffer area allotted for a Cinemark 1, I can see that if I'm just doing standard look ahead, it's a thousand blocks. And then if I look at using our, like our M Dynamics package or some of our advanced and top surface functionality, I can get up to a 3000 block look ahead or buffer. So this kind of gives me kind of a baseline of, of kind of the base memory configuration of the system. And then I can also see, you know, what's my base memory. I see that on the right side. What's my expandable memory to it? All kind of talking to the topic we are discussing today. Okay. So to go to the next step, 
drive a little bit further into this topic, I think it's important for us to now discuss internal versus external memory. So, so at this point, we're focusing solely on part program memory, right? And there really are two different types of memory that you as a user are going to be managing. So internal memory specifically refers to any memory associated with our NC. So NC memory is traditionally thought of as high speed memory, kind of like in a PC, think of it kind of like your RAM memory. Um, now this memory traditionally has been usually pretty limited in the systems. So to kind of offset that from a part program perspective, especially if I had larger part programs, we would then work with external memory. Now back in the day, external memory could literally be your PC that's drip feeding your machine through RS-232. These days, external memory would be something like a USB stick, or you see where I have that little program button, that's actually a mapped network drive, so memory sitting on a server somewhere. But additionally, I can have an onboard memory allocation called our local drive that is still considered external memory because it's not truly NC memory. So we are going to kind of delve into the world of internal versus external because when you're running part programs, it's very important you understand the difference when you're managing files, especially large files. Now you're doing small stuff, you're doing shop mill, shop floor, conversational programming. You don't really think about this topic. You hit the NC button, you write a program. But once you, the files won't fit into it or you're doing all sorts of more sophisticated types of programming, you got to now start to think about how you're managing these files. Now, when it comes to the internal piece of the equation, there's really kind of three areas you can start to explore and see what your internal memory looks like and where you're going to save files to. Now, your standard part programming memory, that's going to be visible under the program manager button and specifically under our NC button. So you notice where on the left side of the screen, I have a button called NC and I have some folders in there. That's internal memory. And when we jump to that, you're going to see there's a specific amount of memory available to me. Then in the center, I have under the system data screen, which is actually part of the setup of the control, there is a user cycles folder. Now this is a folder that's reserved for end users and it's still part of the standard part programming memory. So if you're more of an advanced user, you're creating little little routines that you want your operators to run to safely retract the machine or put it in a, a, a part loading position, right? And you're going to create these little cycles, let's say. Well, you have a user cycles folder right there in system data under the machine system parameters, and that's going to use the same memory that's allotted to your NC. Now, however, let's say you're a commissioning engineer and you're not looking so much at the end user part program memory, but you're talking about the system memory. Well, then we have that NC memory area, and this gives you a great idea kind of how your memory is allocated. So if I jump over to Cinetrain, um, this is certainly a PC emulator, the control. I'm not logging to a control right now, but really what we do with the control, it's going to look the same thing here. I can start to see if I go to my program manager button, all right, I can hit my menu select key and go to program manager. I start to see, okay, look, I got 6.2 megabytes of free space. Now that is the allotted memory under the NC or my internal memory. Every other source here, when I see different amounts of free space, this would be all considered external memory. So we're going to get to that next. So in NC, I have all my subfolders. Now, what's important is kind of paying attention to the 6.2 megabytes. Because let's say I'm going to be one of those advanced users, like I mentioned, and I'm going to start to create little user cycles under the system data area. So now I'm in the machine parameters, and I go in, and I go to cycles, and I click on user cycles. See how I see the exact same amount of memory? Because it's all the same common memory. If I put something in here, I'm utilizing or using my user memory. So the way this structure works is we expect the manufacturer to use his own memory. And you notice I have a different allocation of memory. If I go to manufacturer cycle versus user cycles, 
Same thing for standard cycles. Those are our cycles. That's our area. So if you're a manufacturer, you should really be putting all your stuff in the manufacturer folder or you're using up your end user's memory by putting stuff in user cycles. Same scenario, you as a, an end user, be very careful what you do in manufacturer. In, in this folder right here, there could be all kinds of stuff that the manufacturer does to make that machine unique to them. So I would say avoid doing anything in the manufacturer's folder. You're going to use user cycles. That's allotted for you. Now, if you are a commissioning engineer and you want to explore more of the internal memory, just go to the NC button under Setup and select the NC Memory tab. And this will start to give you a very interesting perspective of all of your different memory allocations within the control. And you know, when you're commissioning a control, all of these different pieces of the puzzle start to stack up using up your memory. So like, let's say I look at this R variables, right? Those are system variables that are available for a user, right? So a lot of times users will come to me and say, oh, we, we, we want more than the 100 R variables that are available to me right now. 100 because obviously we start at zero. So sure, we could make this 1,000. We can make it 5,000. But keeping in mind, the more memory or the, the more variables you create, the more we have to have this memory allocation reserved for these, you're just using up system memory. So this little screen right here, this does give you an interesting snapshot. Um, if you are running out of resources, kind of where everything is allocated to. Now, this is not a place for an end user, for sure. Um, if you're an end user, you're going to be spending the majority of your time either in the part program, program manager area, or if you're an advanced guy, maybe you're going to be putting in some cycles under the user cycles. Leave the other areas, obviously, for the experts when it comes to setup and commissioning of the controls. So this is starting to kind of map out what we would consider internal memory, right? So let's talk about kind of the structure of internal memory, right? This is this is how I was starting to mention the different areas um, that I have memory that I can allocate. Now it's important as I start to use these different memory locations and I, I do things like, let's say I'm going to call up a subroutine, right? And my main program is in one of the folders under my NC folder, and I got a sub program somewhere else. Well, when you start to use main programs and sub programs, it's real important to understand kind of the mechanism that controls how the system knows where to look and where to grab info. So what I did was I created just a quick little example where we got a, a simple program and we're going to call up the same file name but let it sit in multiple locations within our folder structure. Now I will say 100% this is an absolute no-no. <laughs> For sure when you start to create part programs and sub programs you want to make sure that you do not have the same name file f existing in multiple places because as you're going to see you may not be hitting the file that you're expecting to hit it. There are some rules when it comes to calling up subprograms that's going to come into play that's going to dictate which sub is actually being utilized at what point in time. Even though I have all this memory allocations, I can put files all kinds of all over the place. Now, when I call up the sub, there's a couple different ways I can call it. Um, I can as you see in this, this little uh, NC workpiece main pro uh, program demo part, I can just type the name of the file. But when I type the name, for sure, you are totally at the mercy of where the system's going to look for that file. Now, there is also a nice little cycle within our editor that allows me to navigate to the sub, and then it'll build a call statement for me. And if it finds it needs it, it'll give you a path, if it's sitting under the normal folder structure, it'll just put in a call. So any one of these three methods would be suitable when calling up subs, but I do need to know where it's going to look. So let's kind of take a peek. So to do this example, I created this little main program, and all it's going to do is it's going to look for sub one. 
Now sub one, I have existing in three different spots. You can see it's it's in the sub program folder. It's in the main program folder. And as well, it's also existing over here in the user cycle folder. Now in each sub, I just put a little message to tell us which folder it's actually hitting. Where is it finding this sub? So right now, if I just come to the main, there's my little main program, and all it does is call up the sub and then to put it into a program stop. And I hit cycle start. So the first place it's going to look in this structure that I have right now is the sub program folder. So it's not grabbing the one in user, it's not grabbing the one in part programs, it's grabbing the one in the sub program folder. Let me reset that. So generally, the way it's going to work is this. We're actually going to look first in whatever folder the, um, the, the program is sitting in. And then if I don't see anything there, the main program that is, I will look at the subprogram folder. So for argument's sake, if I copied and pasted this little one, and instead of saying I'm in part, I say work, piece, folder, right? I'm going to run the same file. Now you see, boom, it's hitting the work piece folder. So generally speaking, it's going to look at whatever folder the main's in. If it doesn't find it there, it's then going to start to look for the other areas. Now, I'm going to just uh, delete that file. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just rename this one so it no longer looks there. So where is the next spot it's going to look for? So now if I run it, and it doesn't see anything in its core folder, and it doesn't see anything in subs, the next spot it looks is in that user folder. So at this point, it's actually jumping over to the user folder. Now what's interesting about the user folder, um, in, in turn in relation to the other area of allocation, right? normally, we'll say we're going to go back and rename this file. Normally, when I find a sub, and I type the name or I use a call, it goes blue here because it's now a cycle. And the system, if I put the cursor on it and I just right arrow over, will actually open up the sub for me. So it makes it really handy when I want to kind of see and jump in and out of subs for editing purposes. Once you place that routine in the user folder, you're kind of telling us, hey, you know, I don't want my operators or my programmers editing this file. I don't want them going into it. This is this is my my cycle that should not be edited, right? So once the system sees that, it's still going to find it, but it's not going to let you open it. So it's going to grab it, it's going to run it, but it's going to appear as if this is, is not an existing sub. That's because it's using that other one. Now, how do I get to the one that's sitting in the part programs or or maybe I had a sub in some other nested folder. So this is a great use case of using under various the subprogram function. And what this will allow me to do is now navigate to the sub that I want to use. And in this case, it needs the path to find that sub. So if we run our program now, you'll see I'm hitting the one that's in the part program folder. So be aware of this. You know, yes, I told you, don't have the same file in multiple places, but same scenario, even if I only had one file, had I put it in a spot it won't naturally find, boy, I could start to chase my tail with this kind of stuff. Um, so certainly I would, by default, if I'm going to do call subs in their true nature, probably stick them in the subprogram folder or keep everything in the same folder, right? Main subs, and then you're always going to be safe. So that's how my internal memory starts to work and how I can start using it and calling different routines. But what happens when I get to a large file? You know, I only had, what, six and a half meg of memory. That's not very big. So... In the past, this was really a challenge with CNC systems, right? I had to go into some kind of fancy DNC and jump through all these hoops to utilize external memory. Now for us, 
we have, and certainly we define it as external memory, and we have a bunch of different variations, as you see here on the right. Um, A28s happen to have a CF card slot, so you can put a CF card right into A28. That would be specific to the non-touchscreen variants, um, where I could use that as, a, as an expanded memory. 840 and Cinemark 1, as well as, uh, as A48 Cinemark 1 have a local drive that's an expansion of my CF card, but still external memory. Um, those happen to be options in the system, but those are other areas we can have as external memory. Same thing with my USB that exists on all our control platforms. Um, network drives certainly exist in A40s and Cinemark 1, uh, would be an option in the A28. Uh, I can't speak to the 808. I've actually personally never tried to network and run from a network, so I don't know its limitations. But um, for sure, 828, 840, and Cinemark 1, you can absolutely run from your network drive. Now, when you get to using these external memories, you're going to find they're, they're super forgiving, right? There's not a lot I have to do anymore. It's really as simple as kind of just place the program on that external memory location. So here I have a little folder with some different programs that have been written. And you know these programs get relatively large. So in this case, and I'm going to get rid of that because we're going to add that to the example later. In this case, I have a file that is 24,000 lines of code. Now this program most likely will not fit in my internal memory. However, when it's sitting on external, and this could be on the USB device. This could be on my network. I can open it, edit it. I can actually go and you know hit my execute button and it cycle start and run it just as if it was an internal. So from my side as a user, it's almost you know it's almost impervious to me knowing you know where I'm running the file from and, and, and nor do I kind of care right as long as I'm I can get it into the system and hit cycle start I'm gonna let it go and it's gonna it's gonna run from there and as long as I'm running from the start to the end now certainly I can stop things in the middle I can do block search maybe find the interruption point it was it was stopped at as long as I use a with calculation method I can actually scan to the point at which I stopped from and do what we call a safe mid-program start. So you can do all of this running from external memory. And when I say running from external, any of the memory sources I mentioned. So I happen to be doing it from the local drive, but if I wanted to, I absolutely could be running this program right here and maybe I put it on my USB stick. Right, stick it over on the USB stick. Once it's over there on the USB, I can do all the same things. I can edit it. I can I can open it up, make changes, go over to execute, hit cycle start, run it, whatever I want to do from these sources. So this would be how I can start to utilize this external memory. Now, some of these are going to be standard. Certainly some of them are going to be options. We're going to talk about that. And specifically, as I get to the local memory or the local drive, that does require an option. Now, um, I don't want to get into certainly the, the dollar value of these options. Uh, certainly, I try to stay away from pricing wherever I can. That's, that's a salesman's game. Uh, but I, I will tell you from experience, this is not a very expensive option. Um, certainly I believe less than a thousand dollars so it's not a big invest especially on a eighty or hundred thousand dollar machine tool but it certainly gives you um, a, a pretty big advantage at the control platform now um, how much memory do I get with this option it's gonna vary um, certainly based on my hardware configuration um, but it's gonna give you somewhere in the neighborhood of six gigabytes of storage so that that's a lot of that's a lot of files. Considering my NC was sitting at like out of the box maybe 10 megabytes of, of storage. So certainly, if you have a lot of large programs and you're looking to run them and store them locally on the machine tool, this P12 option is really a great resource for you. Now, for those of us that commission the system, 
the P12 actually can support two different memory allocations, right? So I was talking early on about part program memory versus system memory. So if you look uh, specific to this display MD 9111, I can allocate portions of this six gigabytes, some to the system, some to the part program memory. Now, by default, um, especially on the later software systems, if you set that to zero, it should allocate the full six gig to part programs. I think there's some dependency on software versions as to how that works. Just keep in mind, I mean, it's still a lot of memory you're getting, but this is shared memory. So you're gonna kind of differentiate this between the system and the part program memory. Um, but it is a, it's certainly a nice simple way to, to add memory to the system if you don't want to run off of like a USB stick or off your network drive. Um, the USB, it's probably one of the areas that I recommend running from the least um, for a couple reasons. One, when you run from a USB, you know, USB itself is not a great connection mechanically, the way it was designed. Um, more important than that, I run into a lot of really cheap USB devices on the market. You know, usually when I get a guy calls me up and says, oh, my control's intermittently stopping in the middle of a program run, and I ask him well, where you're running the program from. Oh, the USB stick. So, okay, whose USB stick are you using? Well, I don't know. I got it for free when I opened up my bank account. Right, right, or you know, I was at a trade show and somebody gave me it with me a brochure on it, and it has a fancy name on it. Probably a really cheap USB stick. So, if you're going to run from USB, get a good stick, get a SanDisk, get, get one of the other name brand sticks. But the other thing I don't love about USB sticks is you got this USB device hanging off probably the front of your control. What's going to keep somebody from walking over and pulling it out, not realizing the machine is running from it? Now, your machine is not going to just put the brakes on and stop. It's going to, what it's going to do is it's going to use up the buffer. And what we don't realize when I start to use um, these devices is we're actually taking chunks of a program and dumping it over to a buffer. So once the buffer memory is then depleted, then the machine's going to stop. So I like a little more secure memory areas like the P12 option or just running right from my network. And certainly running from the network is um, a very viable solution, especially if you're in like ITAR type facilities and you don't ever want to put these secure programs at the control, uh, you can certainly do it. Now, we were talking about adopting sub programs and using subs and mains from a, from a local drive perspective, but External memory, you can do the same thing. Now, with this, the calls can be a little different. So that's why I wanted to kind of point out how to work with main program, sub programs when I start to work with this external memory. Now, specifically, you notice the call has an ext call command on it, ext, standing for external. So the system knows immediately when it sees X call, I'm now going to look somewhere other than my internal NC memory. But from there, you can jump to any program on anywhere you want, let her jump back in. Now, the format you see here, I'm a big advocate for. Um, I find the industry is trending away from, and we're certainly a big promoter of that, trending away from these singular large part program files where I have 30 operations, the thing is 20 gig long, and it's just a behemoth for an operator to navigate through. You know, if I got to do a mid-program restart, God, where is it? You know, if I'm looking at just how many tools do I have to set up? I got to dig through this giant program to find all my different tools. So we're seeing, especially guys that are, are dealing with much larger and larger files, they'll, they'll kind of follow this protocol. They'll break up the program, to individual operations, and those will be subs. And then usually in the main, like you see here, this is gonna contain um, some of my, some of the areas that I know I would want an operator to be looking at. Tool changes, maybe feeds and speed commands, um, possibly technology cycles like high speed commands. And then we really leave the, the sub program to be the core of the tool path. 
And when it's done with that toolpath, it jumps back into the main. Here I have a little SUPA safety retract and, a, and an optional stop between each operation. But I can now jump between main and sub with this type of format. Now my main, the main does not have to exist in the internal memory. It can be anywhere you want. I usually have a tendency to put my main in my internal memory. So here I created this little program example too. Now what this is doing, just like we saw over there, is I am now calling subs, but the sub I'm calling is not here in internal memory. If I go back to my program manager and look at my local drive, it's actually under this X call example folder. So I took each of these operations, right? I cut out any of the tool changes and uh, took out the workpiece blank definition. And now I'm bouncing in and out of this routine from my main program. Now, when you start to run this, right? When I hit execute, come over to auto and hit cycle start, a real handy function is this program levels button because it's going to tell you where you are as you're jumping in and out of these different files, right? So I hit cycle start and you notice, boom, the system jumps in to my op one. I get my little op one message there. I'm going to crank up the feed rate. I get my little op one message here. And then as I jump in and out of this main, you're going to see that little program levels windows updates for me. So, you know, if I jump in multiple nestings of different subroutines, I see that. Uh, and you can see I could go eight levels deep right here alone. Now, just about the end of the first op. Now it jumped into the second op. Certainly I could have turned on the op stop. Maybe I go in and turn on operational stop here. Now when she gets finished with this one, it's going to pause in the main program before it goes into op three. So this is a really nice way to start to kind of manage these different operations. Now think of it from a end user perspective. So here we're back up in the main. Let's say I aborted, but I aborted right here just before my op four. Now having this nice little structure, I can now in auto just move my cursor down to my quarter inch ball, go to block search, start search. Now I don't actually need with calculation because maybe this is a safe starting point. Well, I can even say without calc and it'll just immediately start right from the point which I'm at. Follow my tool change, boom, quarter inches in, it jumps right into up three. Now additionally, you know, we have these different functions where oh what happens if I abort it in the middle of the program you know, like I showed that to you earlier well even with this main sub if I tell it to do a block search and do it with calc say start it'll then scan and bounce in and out of all of these subs miss it I think I lost missed my interruption point so you want to make sure you're at your interruption point when you hit start search It'll scan down to this point, set up all modal commands, and now I can say cycle start. It's always a two cycle start hit. So that still all works with this main sub. What I like about this though, is if I'm starting from the beginning of the subroutine, I don't have to waste my time with that search mechanism. And if you get large files, that search can be a little time consuming because it's got to scan and make sure it gets all the modal commands from that point. But you can start to still utilize all the same functions you've been using, yet adopt this main program subprogram. And as I mentioned, um, the main program does not have to be in NC. I could have it back here in external memory as well. Uh, maybe I'll rename this one to example three, just so I'm not doing any smoke and mirrors. And you'll notice I didn't even have to update the calls. Because the call isn't specific to where the main is located. The call is specific to where the sub is located, and the sub didn't move. I just moved the main, right? Let's create a new main. So you can really kind of run from any source you want. So it really allows us, from a memory standpoint, it's pretty much unlimited, right? You know, you need a, you need a 
a memory allocation for 10 gigabyte file all right well get a 16 gig usb stick and plug it in or run it from your network drive um, memory is not as big an issue especially when i'm running these kind of standard types of programs so if that's the case do i really have any need for adding more internal memory well the answer is maybe <laughs> and i say maybe because a lot of this is going to depend on the type of work you do you know if you're doing jobs and pretty much you're starting from n1 and running to n 10222 or whatever you're going to then probably running from external memory is really all you'll ever need but when you start to explore more advanced topics like in process probing right so i get this little probe that's running around and it's qualifying my part maybe it's doing some qc and then we say oh hey my part's not to spec i just machined the outside of my my profile and because i had a little wear on my cutter or my diameter wasn't set right to begin with i want the system to be smart enough to adjust the tool diameter and then jump back to that operation and rerun it until it gets within spec well this is where you start to see this whole buffer topic come in the uh, your your ipo or our look ahead buffer so depending on how many blocks are there that's all of the blocks i can actually have in reserve for memory now you can see the memory allocation under 26060 so if i looked at my machine right here when i went to machine parameters right and I went to 26, or I think it was 28060. See? Yes, it was. See, this machine actually only even has 150. Because you know, a lot of this will depend on how the builder optimized the machine. So, so what's going to happen? Well, if I jump over to maybe one of these earlier programs, right? This is an entire program. It's going to end all the way down on line almost 24,000, right? So what if I was doing something and I wanted to jump from maybe this line and I wanted to just do a simple go to forward to that end number. So we're going to try to run this program, but run it from an external memory source. Cycle start. Oops, sorry. Hold on. Let me go to execute here and cycle start. And immediately I see block 15 destination jump not found that's because i have a hell of a lot more lines of code than in this case 150 or maybe even a thousand like a lot more than a thousand there so you know if i'm doing robot handling where i'm using a main program i'm jumping back to it all the time i'm getting into um, families of parts parametric programs all kinds of logic statement stuff this is areas where you know having this this limitation with external memory can be problematic so with that said we've added a bunch of relatively new options we've had them now probably in most cases since version 4.7 so it's been a few years but you can now expand the internal nc memory so we're going to show you a couple options now that all relate to your internal memory. So there's really three base options that you could take advantage of. Now, the first one, this top one, this D00, um, this is probably the least used and the most expensive, but it's also been around the longest, I might add. And you're only getting two megabyte chunks to get you to the maximum of the NCU. So I don't know if you remembered early on, we were showing you the, the Cinemark 1 NC63 catalog. And on the right side, it said out of the box, the, the machine comes with 10 megabytes of NC memory, and it was only expandable to 28. So you gotta buy two megabyte bunches of memory. And, and from what I remember, these are pretty expensive chunks of memory. And you only max out at 28. So there's there's not a tremendous, oh, here we go. So there's not a tremendous amount of, of value in this in this one option, right? So the Cinemark one, I can get to 28. 
Um, the 840, depending on the NCU, maybe it was only 16 or 22. And the 828 and the 808, they don't even support this option. So normally if I see somebody add this option in, it's usually an OEM. Um, and they had specific reasons why they wanted to maybe max out this internal memory. What I would suggest, instead of looking at this, if I want to get a lot more NC memory, my kind of my biggest bang for my buck is this P77 option. Now, this P77 is kind of interesting because how much memory you get is going to depend on uh, whether or not you also have the P12 option. So out of the box, on a Cinemark 1, an 840, or an 828, if you get P77, you can immediately get 100 megabytes of NC memory. So that's a far cry from the 10 meg that it was coming out of the box with. Um, now, the A28 only gives you that option. We don't offer P12 in the A28. However, if you have P12 in conjunction with P27, or P77, shall I say, now I can jump up to a 6 gig memory max off my CF card and if I have an IPC or like our older PCU 50 now I can even expand that up to like 40 gigabytes so this gives you a lot of memory at a relatively low cost and this is NC memory this is internal NC memory so for argument's sake if I look at my machine right now right and here I have my local drive so if I just simply Go over and go to my license manager, right? And look at all my licenses, and I'm going to do a search for P77. So this is my user memory extended. By just turning this on with this little checkbox, and now rebooting my system, I'm now converting my local drive into what we call our NC extend. So at this point, once she's powered back up, see how that now says NC extend? So now this is NC memory. So don't let the size fool you and send you train. It's going to misreport because I'm on a PC. I got a lot more memory available. But if I was on a legit machine, again, I'm going to see either 100 meg here or um, up to 6 gig on a CF card or more if I have an IPC or PCU50. But the the big ticket here is I had this program, right? This was the one where I had this jump. And it could not find it because it was outside of the buffer. Well, once it's internal memory, the entire program is in memory. So now that was pretty uneventful because it just jumped to the end of the program. But you notice it didn't give me the alarm. So now I can jump anywhere I want. So I can do that in-process probing. I can be, you know, 10,000 lines into a program and say, hey, go jump back to line 2,000 and rerun the pocket cycle because it's out of spec. You can, you can add that complexity just by activating this memory option. So it is specific to a max size, um, but it is pretty substantial for sure. Um, so... Again, if you're doing standard G code coming out of a CAM system and you're not looking to, to do all this in-process checking and some of these more advanced programming techniques, probably local drive is more than enough. Um, but if you do want to expand and, and you want to be able to actually expand the internal memory, NC Extend is certainly a great option to start with. Now, beyond that, Maybe you're doing some real sophisticated stuff. You got some high-end, you know, robot or pallet pool work handler that's driving into the machine. Then you may want to consider what we call EES, execute from external storage. And you see that little red box and we say virtually unlimited? Yeah, what I can do here is I can map memory that's sitting on a server somewhere. It could be on a USB stick. It could be on a hard drive somewhere. I could assign 100 gigabytes of NC memory to the machine if I wanted to. So this is really P77 on steroids. This is going to allow me to virtually have unlimited internal NC memory. 
generally speaking, you know, I, I've run into cases probably more times than not. We leverage this on machines that have like work handling solutions, robot feeders, that kind of stuff, where EES becomes um, really beneficial for sure um, to the system. Um, but potentially, as long as the file size isn't getting too big, you could probably get there just with P77 for sure. I will say, EES is the most expensive of the options. Um, it's, it's, I don't think it's a tremendous amount of money, but it's certainly uh, above the $1,000 mark. So it's probably, I would guess, somewhere in the $2,000 range. But don't hold me to that. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about some options. Probably next best their question, especially if you're an end user, is going to be, well, what's this going to cost me to get this option? I mean, Chris said that, you know, maybe it's going to run me five, six hundred dollars for the local drive. But am I going to have to bring in a service tech, come on site, activate this license, cost me thousands of dollars of a service call? So the quick, simple answer is nope. You actually could do it all yourself. So when it comes to licensing options on the control, it's, it's really pretty painless. Now. The first thing we give you, and, and what you're seeing here, is you can go in and, and you can activate a license. And the way they work is in the little license screen to our right, you have your license option box and your set options box. Now, if the license is, or if your option is already licensed to your CF card, because the way it works is all this stuff links to a unique serial number on the CF card, you'll get a little checkbox under the licensed. So to use it, all you have to do is check the box under set options. Now, if you do not have a license for the option, it still doesn't mean you can't use it. So what we've done, and we, we implemented this a few versions of software ago, but we've added what we call a trial test period. And there's actually up to six trial licenses or test periods, and each one has a set time length of time a few thousand hours or so depending on the control and whatnot where you can activate a license temporarily so you need to turn something on to get going or or you're in a bind and you want to activate something to get through a job and you're not sure if you're going to keep it long term you can actually go into the system i can go to menu select setup i want to expand my keys over until i see my licenses button and then what will happen is you, you come into all options, you find your license, and you check it. Now, you will not have a checkbox over here in the gray. What happens in Sinutrain, everything's licensed because it's Sinutrain. But on the machine, you wouldn't have a checkbox there. When you come back to, oops, to this screen, it will no longer say that the license key is sufficient. However, I can use this activate test license soft key to turn on one of my six trials. Now. There's six in there, not because we were expecting the end user to have a full six, but the idea is, you know, the OEM first gets the control, he doesn't have all his licenses activated yet, no big deal. He turns on a test license and he commissions the machine. Now the machine ships to a dealer, maybe it's sitting on his floor for a little while, he wants to turn some stuff on for demo purposes, he maybe activates license five. Then from there, machine sells, gets to you, the end user, well, you might have three or four licenses left. Now, once you turn it on, these things have pretty long runtime hours. And as you turn them on and off, um, you don't lose the license immediately until it runs out of the time. So this, this can last you quite a long time. But the test license is a great way to try out a function that you may not be sure if you're going to use it long term and, and want to make the investment in. Once you decide, yes, this is something I want, then you're going to talk to your OEM, you're going to talk to your dealer, maybe you're going to talk directly to us at Siemens, and we're going to quote and sell you an option. And then we're going to send you this nice fancy certificate. And the way it works is there's a unique license number for that option. And then you have your CF card serial number. That's unique to your machine tool. You go to this website. You click direct access, you're going to step through answering a few different questions, and at the end of the day, 
we're going to spit out this giant activation key code. It's the same thing as if you were activating Windows for your PC. So you can literally type in this code, or you can save it as a file onto your USB stick, and you can read in the file key at the control if you don't want to type in this huge code. Either way, once you do that, and that's been done, now you will get the checkbox here, the license, your trial license will shut back off again, and could still be there waiting for you when you want to try something out the next time. So we have certainly tried to make activating licenses as painless as we possibly could. So with that being said, I think we covered a fair amount of material on the topic of memory, memory allocation. So now I want to open it up to the floor here and you guys can kind of fire away any questions you have. Um, looks like we got a couple in here. Uh, so we have one uh, commercial grade USB recommended, uh, much faster and reliable, um, or Bruce corrected himself, industrial grade. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you definitely want to get a higher end USB stick. Um, certainly not only are they more robust and have higher, higher data transmission speeds, um, but they have more read write times. So that's a that's a, an important topic when you get to some of this uh, solid state memory. It's how often can you read and write to it? It has a definitive number of writes. Same thing with your hard drive. So the cheaper the device, the less times you can read and write to it. Uh, the better the device, the more times you got. Okay. Any other questions here? Looking to see uh, what else we got. All right. Uh, Nick asked, is the trial license available for all control options or is it limited to a certain option? No, it is available to all the control options. Now, with that being said, not all control options can be just turned on randomly. Things like these memory options, there's little to no commissioning required. Check the box and it's good to go. Um, you want to add an access? <laughs> there could be a lot of other steps, but yes, all the licenses. So if I looked at it, um, anything that's here available can be utilized and activated with the trial license for the term of the trial. All right, you guys are quiet today. What other questions do we have? So have you guys been exploring doing kind of that main subprogram structure at all? Um, I will have to I will have to say um, once we added in the the tool to be able to actually call up the subprograms, man, it made it a lot easier. The old school of controls before they had this, you had to figure out and write that path out, <laughs> and it got kind of elaborate. Um, so like if you're going to try to figure out the path, let's say, for a network drive, what I would say, easiest thing, just go out to the control, map to it, navigate to it, find your file, let it build your path, and then use that path in your CAM system, right? Because once you do it, the front end of this path is, is always going to be the same, right? It's really just the file or maybe the subfolder that you're writing to. Okay. Um, how can I create bigger measuring log file do, 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 do. so i am assuming you're referring to our measuring uh, let me put this down here our measuring results log file this one so this cycle 150 file um so as far as i know I don't think there's a limitation to this. Uh, I think it's going to limit itself. Um, I don't think I know there to be a limitation. It's going to be limited to the memory I'm writing to. Now, I will say the directory here is whenever you're using the write command uh, or if you're using this logging routine, it's a lot easier to write to internal memory than it is to external memory. When you start to work with external memory, you have to use the ext open command, which gets kind of tricky. Um, for sure. So um, you do want to be careful of that. Uh, but 
other than that, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not aware of a limitation to the size of this file. So, uh, Tom, if, if you want to elaborate, please do. Um, so Mike was asking, so each trial has 2,000 hours, or, or is it spread out over all the trial licenses? So the, the way it actually works is the earlier trial licenses have more time than the later ones. Um, I think the first one might even be like 3,000 hours. So the 2,000 isn't spread over the six, but uh, each license does get a little bit smaller as we get closer to the end. Um, and then, the, then depending on the control, I think the 828, their trial license times are shorter than 840 or Cinemark 1 because of the complexity of the product. So don't hold me to the set time, but it's a lot. You get a lot of hours under the trial license. Uh, there's an MD somewhere that sets the maximum log file size. Oh, yeah, that could be. It's been a long time since I'd looked at that. Um, I would have to dig in to find uh, that MD. I could look really super fast. Um, usually what I do when I'm, I'm searching for my MDs, I don't know why this stupid ribbon keeps popping up. Um, you know, I might just do a quick search. Let's see if I can find anything under log. Log might be a little too generic. Uh, I would expect it would have probably been a channel MD. Yeah, no, I'd have to, I'd have to find out. I wonder if it's actually, you know what, one, <laughs> one of the areas that might show us. Let's take a quick look under this memory allocation area. Uh, they're giving it, to, it might actually be in here. Um, so it could be just as simple as, oh, there you go, system size, log file size. So this one doesn't look like there's any file size allotted to it. I would need to dig into this further to be sure that that is actually affecting the... Um, the right command. Uh, Chauncey always also mentioned the system variable uh, length protocol file. Um, it could be that. That's possible. Okay. So, any other questions before we wrap up for today? Uh, hopefully, you guys found this uh, informative. I always enjoy doing these these different events. Um, oh, so Mike asked, is ACM available for a trial? So ACM, Adaptive Control and Monitoring. So it is, however, ACM is a function that doesn't actually utilize one of the licenses I was showing you there. It requires an external license. So I know the way ACM works out of the box when you set it up. You get a 24-hour trial, and then from there, you can request a trial period a little bit longer than that. Though I think we usually do like a couple-month trial um, before you have to buy it. Um, but that is, that is managed by a different group, so I would have to find out what the specifics are. Good question. Thanks, Mike, for that. Uh, can I do a webinar at ACM? <laughs> well, actually, that's a good question, and absolutely I can. So I've been commissioning and setting up my machine to use ACM. Uh, so I have it now, I have it running. Um, so with that, uh, I am going to look to maybe partner with one of my colleagues, um, a good colleague of mine, um, actually from the NX side. Um, we were going to do some four axis toolpath we thought might be interesting. So with that, um, maybe that would be a good example for ACM. So yeah, we can uh, we can certainly look to uh, to incorporate that in the future. All right. So with that being said, uh, if I if I missed a question because I know I'm bouncing around a little bit, or you guys need anything else, by all means, feel free to reach out to me, and have a great weekend. Thanks everybody for joining us. Appreciate it. All right.